my name is Pablo. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church. Uh, welcome to all of you if you're visiting and those online. Praise God. Let's, let's pray for the little ones so they can go downstairs. So, Father in heaven, thank you again, Lord. Thank you for your sweet presence. There's just something about your presence that it's um, undeniable and uh, hard to explain. But, boy, what a beautiful reality it is, Lord, your presence in our midst. So bless the kids as they go downstairs, Lord. Bless them. Protect them. Continue to grow them up in you in the knowledge of Jesus. Develop their little hearts, their personalities, Lord, their character. I pray that you would be with them. We pray for the parents that are in this mission of discipling kids. Lord, let your wind, wisdom abound in them. Let them train them up in the way that they should go. Lord, be with them in that task, in that mission. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, little ones, you may go. Um, so cool. So, before we go further, could we just take about a minute? And let's just greet one another. Listen, the, God has designed us to be connected. We are, if you believe in Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus. We're family. Whether I spend two minutes a week with you or 10 hours, whatever. We are connected because of Jesus. Let's take a minute. Just greet one another. God bless you. Sorry, to be <laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning. Good to see, Good to you, see you again. We're all the way from Florida. I know. Warm here. Awesome. Thank you for that. It is wonderful. It is wonderful to be connected with God and with one another in the purposes of God. So we are, uh, we're starting a new series. And it's called, the, the, the banner is not quite here yet. But the image that you see on the upper right hand on the PowerPoint, that's going to be the, so if you remember, the previous series was Choose Life. So this new image depicts the fact that we have, <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> that we have chosen life. See, but it's life in the spirit. That's the, that's the name of the new series, life in the spirit. So the, when the elders gather to pray and discern about the next, there's something in, in our choices, in our the Holy Spirit is doing something in our midst, and we need to kind of follow Him always, right? Um, but the, the desire is for this series to help us and challenge us to engage in a flourishing spiritual life through partnership with the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to read the text. So it's Acts, and I have the slides, Acts 1, verse 1 through 11. So I'm going to read the text for context. But there's one verse that I'm going to hone in, and that's 1, 8. And my role, my desire today is to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit. Who is he? And his relationship and role with us. Okay? So I'm going to read the text for context, but not for exposition. I'm not going to go word for word, although it's going to be hard for me not to comment as I read. <laughs> so you know me, right? Amen. All right. Thank you for your authenticity here with me. So let's start. So verse 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach 
until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So the writer of the book of Acts is Luke. And in his former book, the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, Theophilus, we don't know really who he was, but in Luke, he calls him excellency or excellence, so which hints of high-functioning position, person of authority, maybe a centurion, something like that. And look at, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostle, look at Jesus, our model, in collaboration and partnership with the Holy Spirit, he ministered. Verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. After his suffering, crucifixion, death, resurrection, he hung around for 40 days. Just noodle on that for a minute. No doubt. Thomas touched him. My Lord, my God. No doubt about it. Many convincing proofs and spoke about the kingdom of God. The rule and reign of God. That he ushered. The rule and reign of God in the heart of a believer. The kingdom advances one heart at a time. He eventually, his kingdom will rule. But right now it's moving one heart at a time. Verse 4. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father. Father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gather around him and ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? This kind of, it's funny to me. But it smells like James and John, who asked him previously, who's going to sit at the left hand and at the right hand of your throne when you're ruling and reigning? You know, there's some me still in those wonderful knuckleheads, and there's still in me in all of us. Can you say amen? Yep. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. Something to be said about a desire for a knowledge that is not revealed yet. Forbidden knowledge, in a way. God is not asking us to fully understand everything, but to obey Him in all things. And then, verse 8, But you will receive power. That's my focus verse. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said that his, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Could you imagine? They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Those were probably angels that were prophesying and confirming what Jesus had told them. I am coming back. I am coming coming back. So, Jesus was preparing. The, the sermon title is The Preparation. 
And Jesus is prepared them, right? They, he called them, follow me. They observed, the disciples observed Jesus as he manifested his life in the spirit. They were pupils, they were students, they were observing. And in fact, later on in Luke 10, he sent them out, the 72, two by twos, to proclaim the good news to each and every town that he was about to go. Go before me, go ahead, I'll give you authority, preach the good news. Preparing them, discipling them, teaching them. But yet, and they were knowing him. And yet at this point, for this guy, said, wait, wait. Even in the waiting, God has purpose. If you're waiting for something, don't fight it, embrace it. God is up to something. So, life in the spirit, it starts with choosing life. And that's Jesus. Choose life. Choose Jesus. When you receive Jesus by faith, because that's a divine revelation, the spirit works in the heart of an unbeliever. I don't know how to quite explain it, but those of us that have experienced that, he does. It's grace. And the good thing is that nowadays we don't have to wait for the Spirit. It's available right now. So when you receive Jesus by faith, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the action by which God takes up permanent residence I'm not there yet so you could back up just hang in there in the body of a believer in Jesus Christ there's a miracle that when by faith we receive Jesus the Holy Spirit of God recites enters a person to take residence inside of that life bring in a new life of love, of relationship and service to God that we could not do on our own. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon some of the saints, empowering them for service, but not necessarily remaining in them. Praise be to God that we're here now. The Holy Spirit indwells you and me. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. It's in the inside of you and me. The Holy Spirit a lot of times is misunderstood. Some people, because they don't, you know, it's the process of understanding. The Holy Spirit is, not, is misunderstood. It's not an it. Um, in the old King James, the, the scripture that calls him the Holy Ghost, and when you hear the word ghost, you know, whoo, you know, I'm not, what is that? But the Holy Spirit is a person, and it is God. John 14, and Jesus revealed to his disciples the new role of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that he would play in their lives. It says, he lives with you and will be in you. In you. It was prophesied, because remember the, the gift promised by my father in Ezekiel 36 27. This was written, I don't know, 800 years before Jesus. God, through the prophet, said, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. When I look, move you, that definition in the original language is beautiful. It unfolds, meaning I will cause, I will accomplish, I will administer, I will carve into you, I will bestow upon you, 
And I love this one. I will ce celebrate. The definition, I will move, celebrate. So I will, I will put my spirit in you and move you to celebrate as you follow my decrees and be careful to keep, be careful to keep my, lose, my loss. It's a celebration by the Spirit. Hallelujah. So it was prophesied then and it was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. In essence, brothers and sisters, God is not calling us to do anything in our own effort. He's not. There's nothing we can bring to the table. That's why we surrender. That's why we choose life. That's when that revelation comes into our lives. That I am bankrupt. That I can't. That I, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And the payment of sin is death. That outside of Christ, I could never be redeemed. I could never be saved. I could never obtain eternal life. Not on my own. Not on religion. Not on following. On trying to be good. I can't. I fall short. I fall short. And that's why John 15 also says, apart from me, Jesus says, you can't do nothing. Abide in me, and you will bear fruit. Okay? Of all the gifts given to mankind by God, there is none greater than the presence of the Holy Spirit. Your presence, your love is better than life. That's what Psalm 63 says. That's why Moses in Exodus says, if you don't go, if your presence, the Israelites as they were moving through the, if you don't come with us, God, I ain't going. If you don't, are you that desperate about his presence? I tell him every second, if you're not with me, I ain't going nowhere. I know me. I know me very well. He's our best friend. The Holy Spirit is everything. Choose life. Uh-oh. <laughs> but when you choose life, and when you choose life in the Spirit, it requires a death. And it's your own. To die to you. And that's not popular. That's when negotiations... <laughs> compromise, self-justification. Let me find a church that will preach it this way so that I have room to be me, you know? Life in the Spirit, Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. I no longer live. I'm dead. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. John the Baptist says, I must decrease so he can increase. I was going to bring a prop, an illustration, but I forgot it. It's my wife's Baking uh, pan handle thing, you know, the glove, the big old glove. Because <laughs> we're the glove, and we think we're all that. And what the Lord, what God, the purpose of God, it's like that we would be so dead to us that he could insert his hand in that glove, and then in him we live, we move in our being. He guides us. If we're dead, we're dead. If I'm dead, someone offends me, I'm dead. Does a dead person respond to temptation? Does a dead person respond if they're offended? A dead person is dead. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live by choice and by the empowerment of the Spirit, I live differently. I live differently. So, no longer having to control it all. Hallelujah. Dead people don't demand anything. They just go along for the ride. God's driving the bus. We're shotgun. 
We need to trust God. But see, people that do not, friends that do not know Jesus, it's crazy for them. They want to say, why don't you worry like us? Why don't you be anxious like us? You don't have a job. You're going through crisis. You're going through what? The doctor says what? This is the what? Nope. God's got this. I can't explain it, but God is in control. Your friends can't handle that because they are spiritually dead. They are alive to self. And God wants for us to be dead to self and alive in him, spiritually speaking. Okay? So when, they, when you come to the end of you, that's the beginning of life in the spirit. So through scripture, we understand, right, the roles of the triune God. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, but the, the triune God through Scripture, we see that God the Father planned redemption, salvation. He planned it. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and, sin, and, and Eve fell, sin, and he was talking to all of them, including the serpent. Out of her is going to come one that is going to crush your head. You're going to bite his heel. He's going to crush your head. That's the first prophecy ever recorded in Scripture. God himself. Put it in play, the plan of redemption. Jesus accomplished it, and the Holy Spirit is fulfilling it, advancing it until he comes back. Okay? So, lots of things I could say about the Holy Spirit, but I put like a, the top ten <laughs> things that the Holy Spirit does. I was just trying to get at the function, role, and activities. Now, my dear brother, we're ready. Number one, the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Spirit comes to a soul that is dead in sin and creates new life. This is the new birth that Jesus talked about in John 3. Without Jesus, I, rem I was a walking dead. I was alive in me, dead in the inside. And there's a supernatural, born-again, supernatural, divine experience where the Spirit of God gives you life. And you can't manufacture that. you got to humble yourself, recognize that you're a sinner, that without Him, you ain't got a shot. But with Him, all things are possible. Hallelujah. That's one. Number two, the indwelling is in you confirms to the believer that he belongs to the Lord and is an heir of God and fellow heir with Christ. The spirit of you confirms that you're a child of God, especially when the accusations of the evil one, of the enemy that wants to bring you shame and disgust and blame, and you're a sinner. All of that junk, right, Talk to him. I'm his. And the Spirit of God brings confirmation that I'm a child of God. Number three, the indwelling Spirit installs the new believer as a member of Christ's universal church, the body of Christ. According to 1 Corinthians 12, it says 13, for we are all baptized by one Spirit. So as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Mm, talking about baptism. Do you know that next Friday, the 23rd, there's baptisms here? There's about nine people, Josh, or so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's at 7 p.m. here. We're a community. Come and party. The Bible says that when a sinner repents, there's a party in heaven. Let's bring one here Friday when people get back. Let that minister to you and encourage those that are coming. That's, that's, 
Baptism by water and spirit. By water and spirit. By water and spirit. Number four. The indwelling spirit gives spiritual gifts. God-given abilities for service. God-given abilities for service to the believer to edify the church to lift up and not tear down to build up and not gossip to extend grace because we need it serve the Lord effectively for His glory there's gift of the Spirit there's so many places there's wisdom there's work of knowledge there's faith there's Gift of healings, there's working of miracles. Yes, to this day, there's prophecy, there's discerning of spirits, tongue, interpretation. To some, he gives some teachers, to some apostles, to, to, to build up. That's why to be part of the body of Christ is not just to come to a Sunday service. We worship together, yes. But it's a commitment, it's an investment to God's assign. I want to bring what he has given me into this family to be used for his glory and to edify my brothers and sisters. The gift that God has given you is not for you. It's for me. It's for us. Likewise, what he has given me is not for me. It's not for consumption. It's for edification. Can I get a witness? Number six, five. The indwelling spirit helps the believer understand and apply scripture to his daily life. The spirit guides us into all truth. It's that small, still voice. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. The word of God shapes an inner ear in you, a spiritual ear. The word of God shapes an ear in the inside of you so you can hear him better. And that small, still voice is faithful to guide you and lead you through all aspects of your life. Number six, the indwelling spirit enriches the believer's prayer, prayer's life, and intercedes for him in prayer. That's in Romans 8. Sometimes there's a groaning. When I'm praying, I don't have words in English nor Spanish. He's like, oh. That's a prayer. He can read my soul. He can read my heart. Oh, God, I need you. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. Number seven, the Holy Spirit empowers, the indwelling Holy Spirit empowers the yielded believer, the yielded believer. Yield, submit. Don't fight them. You can have conversations with God. We've all had them. Oh, but why? You know, but he's so wonderful that he allows us as friends, as we in relationship to do that. The Holy Spirit empowers the yielded believer to live for Christ and do his will. Not my will, your will be done. The Spirit leads the believer in path of righteousness, Romans 8. He's our moral compass. He's our GPS, our God positioning system based on Scripture. You're looking at me funny. Are you following? Okay. Number eight, the indwelling Spirit gives evidence of the new life by producing the fruit of the Spirit in the believer's life. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, long-suffering, hanging in there, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I could tell sometimes by just watching a person and looking at their fruit. It's like, oh, that person knows Jesus. I could see the character of the Lord in her or in him. Whereas Galatians 5.21 talks about the fruit of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, idolatry, hatred, contentiousness, outbursts of wrath and anger, envy, drunkenness. Evidence of the new life. There, number nine. The indwelling spirit is grieved 
when the believer sins. When we show some of those fruits that are not the right fruit, we grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit. But it's that Holy Spirit that convic convicts us to confess our sin to the Lord so that fellowship is restored. That's in 1 John 9. If you confess our sins to me, I am faithful and just to forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come on, child, get up, go. You know, it's almost like when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples. And you know Peter. Peter was just like, hey, no, no, you wash my whole body. You know, I'm, you know, he goes real extreme. Pedro said, no, you have been cleansed. I want to wash your feet. You're still walking in this earth. And your feet touch the earth and your feet get dirty. Let me wash them. You're cleansed, but let me wash them. What a Savior do we have. Um, and then, number 10, the indwelling spirit seals. It's a seal. It's a, it's a mark. It's a, it's, a, it's a down payment. The believer unto the day of redemption, so that the believer's arrival in the Lord's presence is guaranteed after this life. Hallelujah. That's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So, I'm almost done. Let me, so let me explain. So, I believe we have been in preparation. We're all as believers. We are in cycles of preparation. There's a larger preparation and a smaller scale preparation and a smaller scale preparation. In fact, this life is a preparation for what's to come because we're called to rule and reign with Him. We don't know how that looks like, but then all of this is preparation for that. In this life, there's cycles of preparation. Acts 1 8, I will give you power so you could be my witnesses. So, in a life of a believer, there's a process. Let me explain in the context of the Holy Spirit about growth and the infilling of the Holy Spirit in this process. It is the scripture that kind of helps me. It's out of Luke 2:52 where it says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. It's the same for us. So what does it mean to grow in favor with God? At the core of Jesus' growth was an understanding of his purpose in life. Jesus knew that his growth was ultimately preparation for the fulfillment of his mission. He knew the importance to become close to God through the discipline of prayer, scripture study, fasting, etc. So the preparation of the growth, he knew that I, he needed, the Son of God needed to be tight, connected, seeking the Father. Because in that, by the disciplines of prayer, of the scripture, it's going to open up, it's going to mature him, it's going to grow him so that the favor of God could grow also in that believer. What does it mean to grow in favor with man? Jesus grew in favor with man. As we grow closer to God, we will naturally grow in our love for others. And I think the 1-8, Acts 1-8, but you will receive power. I would put in parentheses, you will receive love. Romans 5 says, God, God's love has been put in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. To be a witness for God, you have to love God and others, not with your love, but with the love that has been placed in your heart by the Holy Spirit of God, okay? There's a progression, preparation. Jesus is disciple in us, right? So for us, drawing close to God 
through the discipline of prayer, scripture, study, fasting, etc. It's connected to the growing favor of God upon our lives. We want to advance the gospel as a kingdom family, don't we? We need to get closer to God together. Okay? And as you grow closer to God, your love for Him grows and your love for others grows. And when you love others with that love, oh my word, you're, you're, you're moving in the power of Acts 1 8. Okay? So I want to say this to end. I don't doubt God can do anything He wants, He's sovereign. Someone can pray for you and you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and then July 4th explosions and all of that. I, he could do that. He's God. But we can be filled with the Holy Spirit daily by yielding our will to God in submission and obedience to His Word. That's the infilling. He's indwelling. We're giving him permission to go to every room in your heart. Not to leave him in the family room. If we, through the discipline of prayer, of fasting, of scripture, of studying together, we're saved individually, but we grow together collectively. Home groups, Bible studies, weekend internships. Like, come on, let's dig into the Word. Men's ministry. Now they want to put the Word of God at the center of the gatherings of men. The Word of God. That discipline. That discipline. That discipline to grow you closer to Him so that you can love Him better and serve Him better and love others as well. That's what He wants. Right? So, individually in failing. So, you want to be continually infilled? Fill your life with Jesus. Number two, fill your mind with Scripture. Commit it to memory. The Word of God I've hidden in my heart, O oh Lord, so that I don't sin against you. That's what David said. It's not to score brownie points with God. You're growing in Him. You're growing in favor with Him. You're allowing the Holy Spirit to gain more territory in the inside of you so that He can use you. Number three, fill your routines with rules. Let me explain. Put some fences. Develop virtue to your faith, add virtue, goodness. We're still in this flesh. Put some fences around some of the things that are still a process in your life. Number four, fill your friendships with accountability. Don't be a lone ranger. The provision of God for my life has been dear brothers and sisters that have, that there's trust and connection where I could be transparent. And they can pray with me and for me. Sin, like Adam and Eve, have a tendency of you want to hide, you want to cover. It says, exp confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. There's a flip with that. Right now, I don't go to everyone. God brings accountability. I intentionally need it, and I seek for it. That's growth that's going to gain favor, that it's going to allow you to witness with power. You follow the thread. Number five, fill your soul with the resolve to draw close to God. At this stage of my life, I don't want to live one second without God. I'm done. And I'm sometimes saying, I'm sorry, Lord, it took so long for me to get to this spot. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want anything that this world has to, I don't want it. There's no appetite. I want God. The fullness of him in my life. More of you, oh God. Have mercy on me. 
Start a hunger. Give me a big old spiritual pretzel with a lot of salt. That I can be thirsty for you and pursue you. When I wake up, even in the middle of the night, when I go potty or to the restroom. <laughs> See, when you're with family, you forget. <laughs> I think about him. <laughs> Lord, put me back to sleep. Oh, God, thank you. You know, and, but you know, Lord, you were. I'm not bright. I'm just saying it has taken this long, him working in me and through you and through all. Amen. Could we stand? So this is what I like to do. I mean, there's going to be obviously the prayer team and people. I believe God, God prayed. I believe in prayer. Absolutely. And I am going to pray. That there would be an activation and an ignition in you. In those that are hungry and thirsty for more of God. I'm taking a moment because I don't want to. Please, please. There's, there's opportunities. There's. There's Cairo. Cairo is time. Kronos is this particular time. I think there's a Kronos for those that are seeking. Why? Why? As a pastor, why? We're together. I'm committed to you. You're committed. We are, we're advancing the, the, the gospel together. So I need you to activate. God wants you to activate. So because it's not about me, it's about him, it's about us. That's why I have confidence that he will listen to the prayer and he will activate. Can I get a witness? So all heads bowed, please. And if that's you, place your hand on your heart, please. If not, that's okay. No, you know. So Father, in the name of Jesus Christ now, I thank you for the mighty, powerful word of God and for the preciousness of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for who you are. Thank you for not leaving us alone. Thank you for living and indwelling us. Lord, we want more of you. Holy Spirit, gain more territory in my soul, in my heart, I pray. And for those brothers and sisters that are believing you for more, I ask in Jesus' name that it would be so. Enlarge the tent. Pull the pegs. Grow it in the name of Jesus. Let there be a new diet, a new appetite, a new desire to chase for God and God alone. I pray in Jesus' name that idols would fall in the name of Jesus. That idolatrous behavior would be exterminated in the name of Jesus. That you would change the hearts of your people to seek you and you alone. Thank you for placing us in this time in history. Thank you for placing us where we needed to be, where you have designated us to be. And Lord, we want to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be your witness. Fill us with your love. Oh God, we want to be different because of your presence in our lives. We trust you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and the church says, hallelujah. If you want more prayer, love to pray with you. But be blessed, my brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. Amen.